Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us again for this uh, webinar brought to you by the Sclera Lens Education Society. Usually tonight's uh, webinar is sponsored by the good people at Avidro. We're very happy to have uh, the famous Dr. John Gellies to present to us tonight. If John Gellies, he is the uh, director of the Specialty Contact Lens Division at the Cornea and Laser Eye Institute Hirsch Vision Group and the CLEI Center for Keratoconus, a subspecialty clinic dedicated to research and treatment of keratoconus in Tenick, New Jersey. Uh, his clinical work is dedicated exclusively to specialty contact lenses and surgical co-management for keratoconus, corneal disorders, ocular surface disease, and post-surgical corneal conditions. He's a, uh, a sub-investigator for multiple keratoconus-specific clinical trials and is a consultant to multiple companies focusing on diagnostic instruments, treatments of keratoconus, and specialty contact lenses. He's a graduate of the Pennsylvania College of Optometry and an adjunct clinical professor for both the SUNY College of Optometry and New England College of Optometry. He serves on the executive board of the International Keratoconus Academy, the board of the Contact Lens Society of America, and the advisory board of the Gas Permeable Lens Institute. Additionally, he is a fellow of the International Academy of Orthokeratology and Myopia Control, the Contact Lens Society of America, and the Sclera Lens Education Society. And with that, I will turn it over to John. Awesome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And thank you to Avidro for sponsoring tonight's lecture. Um, I'd also like to thank the uh, Sclera Lens Society for having me do this and uh, uh, the International Keratoconus Academy for, uh, you know, being an uh, academy with this, a great resource for uh, individuals looking to learn more about keratoconus and stay up to date on the, uh, the research that's coming out. So, I've got a couple disclosures, a little housekeeping here. Um, I am a, a, a consultant to Avidro and a significant amount of other companies that are related to the uh, cornea and contact lens space. And I also have to give some acknowledgments to uh, Dr. Peter Hirsch, uh, Dr. Uh, David Chu, and Dr. Stephen Greenstein, uh, my colleagues at uh, CLEI. Uh, to give you a little background on that, uh, CLEI was uh, formally inaugurated back in 2002 under the direction of Peter Hirsch, who was the medical monitor for the uh, cross-linking clinical trials in the United States. And uh, as Drew had said, we're dedicated to uh, research and treatment of keratoconus. Um, so let's get into keratoconus itself as a disease. Uh, the background of keratoconus is really that it is a progressive corneal disease. Uh, it's characterized by focal thinning, steepening, bulging in a regular shape, um, which is really caused by a loss of biomechanical strength of the corneal stroma. It's a bilateral, asymmetric, and clinically non-inflammatory condition, which typically starts at around puberty and progresses up until about the fourth day, decade of life, where the uh, disease will typically stabilize and progression will stop. Uh, the prevalence of this disease in the United States has been classically reported as around 1 in 2000. Now, this was based on a Kennedy study that was uh, a retrospective study, a uh, school site, uh, which used classical instrumentation to be able to diagnose uh, keratoconus, looking at things like old school keratometers and scissor reflexes and slit lamp findings. Uh, most recently, uh, and internationally, this has been suggested as being significantly more prevalent. Um, you have a uh, 1 out of 375, which was reported out of uh, the Netherlands, and you have a newer number that came out in 2019 in Cornea uh, that was reported as 1 in 191 individuals in New Zealand population. In, in New Zealand population. And this change uh, is in attributed uh, to the advanced diagnostic instruments that have come out that are able to find keratoconus at a much earlier point in the uh, disease uh, timeline. So we all know the progressive uh, uh, impact on the vision that uh, keratoconus can present. So we can see on the left-hand side a very early keratoconic individual, and when we correct those lower-order aberrations with a pair of glasses, uh, you can see that that individual is able to get quite good visual acuity. But as we keep correcting those lower-order aberrations, 
uh, and the character component keeps getting worse, you can see that our vision is getting progressively worse, despite trying to uh, do our best with those glasses corrections. Uh, and that's due to those higher order aberrations that are created by that irregular corneal shape. Uh, we all know the advanced slit lamp signs that we're going to see, that, um, such as Vokestria, apical scarring, apical thinning, some Fleischer rings, um, you know, high drops in uh, situations where decimase tears and uh, uh, we end up getting edema of the cornea in that area, as well as Munson sign. But these are all uh, the type of signs that you're going to see when the disease is at a very advanced state. Um, so the traditional management of keratoconus in the United States had been to diagnose this disease uh, when symptoms or, uh, or findings were obvious um, and then go ahead and visually manage those individuals uh, with contact lenses, specifically rigid gas permeable lenses. Now, originally we had no treatment for keratoconus so we had nothing to stop the progression of this disease so those individuals would continue to progress without being able to be controlled and you know we just have to wait and see how bad they would get it in many cases the progression would lead to a point where the individuals would become either intolerant to their contact lenses or have complications with their lenses uh, and then we could have advanced scarring forming in the cornea and then our uh, treatment of last resort would be a penetrating keratoplasty if we were at that point now penetrating keratoplasty uh, had been reported in the literature of having a rate of anywhere from 12 percent of uh, 12% to 21% of individuals with keratoconus. Um, and when we look at the CLEC study specifically, they outlined some risk factors that would happen in individuals with keratoconus that may lead them to go to a, a corneal transplant sooner than later, and that was a younger age, steeper keratometric values, worse visual acuity, corneal scarring, uh, poor contact line comfort, and poor vision-related quality of life. Uh, those individuals tended to have penetrating keratoplasties much sooner. Um, now, about 2016, uh, corneal collagen cross-linking gets FDA approval within the United States. Now, the approved devices um, and pharmaceuticals are all coming from Avidro, you know, the KXL system, which is the UVA illumination system, uh, Fotextra, which is um, uh, spelt incorrectly there, <laughs> um, but uh, which is the riboflavin that you would use, um, and Fitexor viscous, which is a riboflavin uh, with a dextran uh, in it. Um, and those together create the uh, photochemical reaction, which is responsible for the cross linking effect. So the ability to be able to stop the progression of keratoconus has really created a paradigm shift in the management of keratoconus within the United States. And that's now shifted to being able to diagnose this disease as early as possible, trying to stop progression with corneal collagen cross-linking, then rehabilitating those individuals with surgical uh, procedures or specialty contact lenses to improve the vision, and to monitor these individuals often so that we can make sure that they're not changing and not progressing over time, if they are, to go ahead and get that cross-linking performed, and to keep our modern forms of corneal transplantation, such as DALC or penetrating keratoplasty for these individuals, uh, as our last resort. Um, now, what uh, corneal collagen cross-linking really does is it puts the emphasis on early diagnosis, because now we have the ability to stop the disease. So really what we want to do is try to differentiate normal from early keratoconus and kind of lower our threshold for working up those individuals who maybe have had shifting uh, you know, refractions, uh, you know, not able to correct down to 2020 in the absence of obvious disease. Uh, those individuals who, you know, have those kind of vague complaints of, you know, halos, flare, glare, those sorts of things at nighttime with driving, and basically be able to diagnose these individuals as early as possible. So with that, we're going to use a combined data approach uh, from multiple different in uh, instruments, such as the, uh, the scans that you see on the right here. Uh, on the top left, you'll see a, uh, a uh, Harpenshack uh, aerometry 
of the sensor. Um, on the bottom left, you'll see that placido disc on that normal cornea. Um, and then to the right, you'll see a shine flow tomographer. And to the right beyond that, you'll see a, a OCT uh, of the cornea. Uh, when you look at this with keratoconic individuals, you can see how they all warp and are distorted. And that's how we're really finding this keratoconus as early as possible and using these metrics for a better way to monitor progression. Um, so when we look at corneal maps, we're all aware of the differences between a normal cornea and a KC cornea. In the uh, axial curvature map we can see here, you can see that hot spot there of the spleen of the cornea. Um, also, we can look at the elevation maps, both of the, the anterior and posterior cornea, and we can see those little uh, hot spots present uh, on the anterior cornea. We're looking for greater than a uh, uh, eight micron uh, elevation there, and on the back surface, about a 15 micron elevation is being significant. Um, on the curvature map, we're looking at greater than 48 diopters is being significant for a uh, keratoconus. And then on the last map, the pachymetry map, we're looking at uh, basically below 100 microns as being something that we should start raising our flag and saying, no, this could be keratoconus. Uh, when we look at aberration profiles, uh, Lim and Kosaki looked at this back in 2007 and found that uh, higher order aberrations were actually a pretty good way to differentiate uh, normal care, uh, normal cone or excuse me normal corneal patients from early keratoconus from full blown keratoconus and we have an example of that here you can see the normal cornea up top and the amount of higher order aberrations there are low. When you look at the RMS value, it's about 0 0.4. 0 0.4 or lower would be the amount of higher order aberrations you would see in a normal corneal patient. Whereas when you see the uh, keratoconic individual, like you do on the bottom here, you can see they have significantly more higher order aberrations, as well as a much higher RMS value present there. Um, and that's how we can really differentiate that based on aberrations alone. Now, a new area of interest is corneal biomechanics uh, and kind of how do we get a in vivo measurement of that. Now, currently, these are based on uh, NCT devices uh, and being able to collect the metrics of, uh, of rebound and flattening and the speed of which things are flattening um, to be able to tell the difference between a normal and a keratoconic cornea or a weaker cornea from a stronger cornea. Um, so in this image, you can see uh, this is a corvus, um, and you can see how the uh, deflection of the cornea of the normal cornea is pretty uh, robust. You can see how the cornea pops down and then pops back up relatively quickly, whereas the, uh, the keratoconic cornea uh, uh, deforms very, very easily, stays down, shakes quite a bit, and then has kind of a syrupy response upward. Um, so those are kind of metrics that we can look at with that. Now there are some research devices that will make their way to uh, to clinical practice here in the upcoming years in the form of OCT elastography, uh, which is really being uh, performed by uh, BJ Dupes and his group over at uh, uh, Cleveland Clinic at Cole Eye, and then you have a brilliant microscopy, which will make its way as or brilliant spectroscopy rather, uh, which will make its way to clinical practice as well coming up in the next couple of years. Um, so there's kind of actionable metrics that are of interest to individuals. You can see them all there. I'm not going to go ahead and go through them all, but the aberrometry, the corneal curvature, the pachymetry, and the biomechanics are all very, very. Uh, important to diagnosing and tracking keratoconus. And really, we want to go ahead and start to think of this disease uh, not as just a corneal disease, but as a progressive uh, disease state of the eye. So individuals would be best served to uh, think of this like they think of glaucoma. Both are progressive diseases. Both need frequent monitoring of both the structure and the function of the eye. And, uh, you know, even if we get treatment, uh, whether it's by surgical uh, means, such as, you know, MIGS in glaucoma or in, uh, you know, cross-linking and keratoconus, despite having the treatments, we still want to monitor those individuals after those treatments to make sure that they're not still progressing. So we want to go ahead and take a look at that as well. So it really puts the emphasis on diagnosing as early as possible and monitoring those individuals for changes to those disease states. 
Um, so, you know, when we're monitoring these individuals, how do we de we decide whether we're going to monitor somebody closely or less close? Well, just like glaucoma, we're going to look at the risk factors involved, and we're going to say, are you at a high risk for progression, or are you at a low risk for progression? Um, and we're going to do these sorts of, uh, you know, follow-ups, whether they've had uh, corneal collagen cross-linking or not. So if we're at high risk, we may want to follow those individuals every six months. If they're at low risk, we may want to follow them every six to 12 months. Um, so we want to get into some stromal architecture here. We're going to really nerd out on uh, on some of the, uh, the biomechanics of corneas, uh, the way that corneas are kind of laid out and kind of everything that goes along with it. Um, so we'll go ahead and say, you know, that the cornea really is a structure that relies on mature collagen. And there's the natural in, inner and intramolecular crosslinks that are created um, to be able to create the, uh, the cornea structure that we see, that nice dome structure. Uh, when we look at the structure on a microscopic level, what we're seeing are individual helixes of, uh, of collagen that are formed, and those helixes come together to form the microfibril. And then these microfibrils come together to form the fibril. And we can look at this in a couple different ways. So this is a, a different view of this from um, uh, uh, Keith Meek's group here. And you can see that this is kind of the uh, microfibrils coming together to make those fibrils. And then those fibrils come together and are organized into lamellae. So those very large uh, bands of collagen that come across the cornea to be able to make up the corneal structure. And you can see that orthogonal interweaving there. Um, so when we look at this, the ordered arrangement of these fibrils and lamellae and extracellular matrices really maintain the optical shape and the structural integrity. Now, there are uh, variable, uh, you know, structures within the cornea, or rather orientations of that collagen within the corneal structure. So if we look at the, uh, the uh, central cornea, there is an uh, inferior, superior, and kind of nasal temporal um, orientation of these, uh, these fibrils and uh, lamellae. So what we end up getting is an orthogonal uh, stacking. So you can kind of imagine this as being like the lattice on a pie in the central area there. Um, so we want to have that uh, that interweaving of those corneal fibrils to make uh, make the the cornea nice and strong. Um, now, when we look at that uh, microarchitecture, it also is depth dependent. So when we look at these scans from Meeks group again, what we're seeing is that the anterior uh, cornea, that hot red color, uh, is the stiffest portion of the cornea. And when we look at that at another level, what we're going to see is that the anterior central cornea has this interweaving that happens in the depth of the cornea. So you can see that we have this, uh, this interweaving in the anterior cornea, which continues use into the central cornea, but once we get to the posterior cornea, the, the uh, lamellae are really just stacked on top of each other, just a layering, uh, almost like you would see, uh, you know, in a pastry. Um, so when we look at the peripheral cornea, the, uh, the architecture really changes here to being kind of orthogonally or, uh, or from orthogonally to a uh, tangential or annular sort of positioning where it's kind of wrapping around. And that may support the structure at the limbus um, to be able to support the corneal shape as well. So you can see that here. And we can see that those areas create a little bit more strength around that limbal area in these uh, hotspot uh, grass from Meeks group as well. Uh, you can see that uh, red glowing area down by the limbus in those uh, scans there. Um, now we can also see that there's a transverse oriented limb, uh, excuse me, lamellae that insert into Bowman's membrane. And these typically uh, penetrate about 120 microns uh, into the cornea. And this really acts as support anchors in the uh, corneal structure. And th this is uh, work from uh, Jamie Jester's group. Uh, you can go ahead and see this in the normal cornea that really um, uh, uh, transverse oriented uh, lamellae kind of 
diving in there in those uh, white flecks that you can see there. Now, when we take a look at this, um, there are structural changes that happen in keratoconus. So generally, the stromal lamellae are altered in keratoconus, and we've been able to see this in Meek's work. And what we really find is that the collagen fibrils are unevenly distributed, and we can really see that in the loss of uh, the fibular mass in the apex of the cone. So if we look at the X-ray diffraction, uh, graphs here, you can see in the normal uh, cornea up top, there's more of a homogeneous uh, uh, view of those uh, fibrils, but in the keratoconic corneas, you can see that loss of fibril density in those hot spots, those kind of light, uh, yellow, white areas of the corneas where the apexes are. So when we go into this, we also see that the KC corneas show less lamellar interweaving. So just like we saw those lamellar insertions uh, on the normal cornea, like what we see up top, you can see the loss of the insertions in the keratoconic cornea, like what we see on the bottom there. Uh, so this uh, lamellar disorganization um, may be caused by the loss of those cohesive forces that exist between uh, fibrils and lamellae. Um, so this may lead to mechanical failure um, and slippage uh, uh, at the Bowman uh, anchors that are uh, in the cornea. Uh, now, when we look at the uh, the normal sort of lamellar cohesive strengths um, in the cornea, we have looked at this in uh, Small's work back in the day. What he was doing was separating corneas from the eye bank and kind of looking at the uh, forces needed to separate the cornea at different points of the cornea. And what we found was that the limbus was pretty tough to uh, take the uh, corneas apart, um, and it got easier to take the corneas apart as we got closer to the center of the cornea. But what we also found was that there was a uh, inherent weakness in the inferior portion of the corneas, even in normal corneas. So you can see um, that may predispose the uh, the cone location of keratoconus uh, in individuals. Now, when we look at uh, Dupson uh, and Robert's work um, with finite element analysis, what they were able to show here was a reduction in corneal modulus, so how strong a cornea is, um, is actually more of a factor uh, than uh, thinning of a cornea. So what we find is if we take, uh, this is a graph of, uh, uh, of corneal modulus on the bottom and uh, K-max on, the, on the, uh, the Y axis here. And what we can see is as we reduce the amount of a modulus or make the cornea weaker, what we end up doing is we end up creating an exponential increase in the in the metric value uh, the responsible for the K map. So we ended up creating a keratoconic cornea just by weakening the cornea. And you can see at 10% of uh, weakening of the cornea, there's not much of a change. At 30%, we start to get a change to get us to that keratoconus measurement. And then at the 45% uh, uh, percent loss of uh, modulus, you can see that we go all the way up to a 56 diopter cone. So just a 15% uh, percent drop in modulus from that 30 to 45 uh, creates almost, <clears throat> excuse me, almost a, a 10 diopter change in the, uh, in the corneal curvature. And we can really see that in the simulated maps that are created here. You can see the 10 percent on the uh, on the left, the 30 uh, percent in the middle, and the 40 uh, percent, or excuse me, 45 percent uh, on the right there. Um, when we also look at uh, you know Brulee microscopy, the other thing that's very interesting about this is that it seems to be that there's decreased uh, corneal strength is localized to the cone area on the keratoconus. Um, so what we look at is Brulean really measures uh, you know, propagation speeds of uh, spontaneous uh, acoustic photons within the cornea, uh, or rather within the collagen itself. Um, these phase shifts kind of allow us to uh, extrapolate out the, um, the elastic properties of the cornea. So what we see is if we look at the cone area, we can see that there is a weakness profile in that specific location. However, if we go outside of the cone area, you can see that our strength pro properties are much more close 
to what we would see in a normal cornea in any given point. So that really tells us that the uh, modulus is really reduced, or rather the focal weakness is really contained right to that cone area. So if the you know mechanism of KC is ultimately you know a, a biomechanical weakness, well then we can look at a biochemical uh, you know event as being the trigger to this microtexture, uh, microarchitecture disruption. Um, so when we look at this, the uh, you know there are biochemical and enzymatic changes associated with keratoconus, uh, things such as the upregulation of MMPs in the cornea, as well as uh, increased levels of uh, of uh, cathepsin B in the cornea, um, which may incite those biochemical and enzymatic changes in the cornea, as well as decreased natural corneal collagen crosslinks, um, which are uh, a function of reduced levels of uh, lysyl oxidase or uh, LOX um, enzyme within the cornea. Um, so when we look at all these, that kind of answers the question as why does the cornea bulge in keratoconus? Essentially, it is a biomechanical instability, and this creates a weakness and thinning of the cornea, which leads to our progression of the cornea. So we want to talk a little bit about what we can do to stop progression, and we do that with corneal collagen cross-linking. So how can we stop progression? Well, the lack of biomechanical strength there really begs the question of how do we strengthen it? And, uh, you know, how can we stop the, uh, the progression of the disease? So much like the sidewall of a tire, when it's thin and weak, it tends to bulge and protrude. Same sort of thing happening to the cornea here. Well, there was a seminal paper that came out of University of Dresden. Uh, this is Sproul, Huell, and uh, Seiler's work. Uh, what they looked at was various different methods that they could use to stiffen a, uh, a cornea. And they looked at a variety of different stiffening agents, uh, ranging from just UV on its, cell, on its own, uh, riboflavin with UV at various different wavelengths, riboflavin with sunlight, glutaraldehyde, and Karofsky's uh, solution, basically aldehydes and photosensitizers. And what they found was that riboflavin with a 365 uh, uh, wavelength of UV uh, tended to create the most statistically significant um, uh, increase in modulus of the corneas. So then their first paper was published uh, back in the early 2000s uh, looking at um, inducing uh, uh, crosslinks within a uh, in vivo uh, cornea. And what they found was in this prospective study, they made sure that the individuals who were enrolled were progressive. And what they found was those individuals over time uh, progressed about two diopters. And then what they did was they treated them with corneal collagen cross linking and they found that over time, uh, they flattened by about two diopters. Um, so you're actually seeing a, uh, a reduction of the uh, of the steepening on those individuals. So how does corneal collagen cross-linking work? Well, really, it's three components to it. You have the uh, the UV light, which is provided by the KXL unit, uh, the riboflavin, which is provided by the Fotextra, and then the uh, oxygen, which comes together to kind of catalyze everything. So what we're looking at is all of those together create the corneal collagen cross-linking effect. So you're getting this interaction in that biochemical reaction, photochemical reaction, um, which creates these reactive oxygen species and creates additional covalent bonds, which strengthen the anterior stroma of the cornea. So you can kind of imagine it as adding more rebar to a structure to uh, strengthen it. Um, so when we look at the, uh, the location of these crosslinks, um, if we look at Meek's work here, uh, basically what we're seeing is that the, uh, the distances between the fibrils and lamellae are just too big. We're not getting them on that level. Um, so what we're seeing is that the likely location is in the collagen molecules themselves and at the surfaces of the fibrils. We're seeing more on the uh, uh, intra-fibril uh, level and uh, between the uh, collagen proteoglycan matrix. Um, now, when we look at the uh, at Ching's work um, uh, with uh, second harmonic uh, electro uh, microscopy um, and, uh, you know, F 
FTIR, uh, what we're basically seeing here is that the uh, you know intrafibrillar uh, uh, collagen bonds are being created, and we actually see a slight increase in the uh, collagen fibril mass. Um, so. What's important to the clinician? What do we need to know about this? Well, we have some preoperative duties to do uh, for our patients, and those important ones are that we must establish preoperative baselines. So we want to look at things like uncorrected visual acuity, best corrected visual acuity, topography, refraction, slit lamp findings, and then there are different additional metrics of interest, such as you know specifically the Kmax value, so the maximum steep point on the cornea corneal thickness and corneal densitometry. And densitometry is a measurement of uh, optical clarity in the cornea, which we'll touch on in a little bit. So how do we document progression? Well, we'll just look at the changes that are happening within all these metrics. And the important thing is to document this as much as possible, because the insurance criteria uh, for individuals getting coverage on corneal collagen cross-linking uh, differs from uh, company to company. So some want uh, you know changes in visual acuity plus changes in uh, in uh, keratometry others want changes in keratometry only some people want changes in kmax only um, there's a variety of different ways that they look at this even uh, changes in refractive values um, like an increase in sphere a change in cylinder a change in axis all those sorts of things can be used to document progression so looking at all those factors is very important uh, now, there are some very important pre-op considerations that we need to do. Obviously, we need to look at their ocular history. We need to judge their contact lens wear and say, you know, is this a lens that's going to be warping a cornea? If it is something, we may want to discontinue that so that we can get an accurate baseline. Um, the other thing is, is we have some relative contraindications. So if we have, you know, dense corneal scarring, the corneal scarring may worsen after the uh, corneal collagen cross-linking, but the location and the depth is very important. So if it's central and it's dense, uh, corneal collagen cross-linking could make it significantly worse. Works, but if it's off-axis, uh, that actually, uh, you know, may be beneficial for the individual because as we have more of that cross-linking effect, we may end up flattening the cornea and changing the shape a little bit more. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look here. Also, uh, here, pedic keratitis um, is another one because we may reactivate it based on the photochemical reaction that's happening uh, during the cross-linking procedure. So generally, if those individuals have had a history of uh, herpetic keratitis, we want to consider uh, adjunctive uh, oral viral treatment uh, to be able to mitigate that, uh, that chance of that happening. Uh, the other thing that we want to do is set our patient expectation, let them know the drop regimen that they're going to be using after the procedure, let them know that the vision will be reduced initially and that it will improve typically after the one month mark, and that their contact lens can typically, or their contact lens wear can typically resume uh, after the one month mark, assuming that the epithelial looks uh, smooth and, uh, and illustrious. Um, corneal, uh, and that the cross-linking, um, Though the cross-linking has been performed, uh, the patient still needs to be monitored. This isn't something where we say, oh, you've had treatment now, goodbye, good luck. Uh, this is something where, no, you still have progressive uh, corneal disease, and we still need to monitor that with time. So, you know, even though it's rare, progression can still happen even after corneal collagen cross-linking. The good news is, is that uh, it is very rare. Um, we're actually looking at the 10-year data out of our center right now. Um, and also, uh, you know, if they do progress, uh, you can simply perform another cross-linking procedure for those individuals uh, to halt them again. So under the FDA approval, who can be treated, um, you know, anybody of the age, 14 years of age to 60, uh, 65 years of age, uh, younger than 14, that would just be considered applicable. Uh, what diseases can be treated under the FDA approval? Progressive keratoconus, as well as uh, post-refractive corneal ectasia. So let's talk a little bit about the approved procedure protocol. Well, the approved procedure is this. We create a 9-millimeter epithelial defect using 20% ethyl alcohol, 
Uh, we soak and rub for about 30 seconds, and then we use a Wexel sponge to just wipe away that epithelium. And then we'll use just a blunt spatula to just remove any uh, residual epithelium from the uh, central stroma. Um, what we'll then do is go ahead and give riboflavin drops uh, every two minutes for 30 minutes. Um, and then what we do is uh, go ahead and check for riboflavin uptake at the 30 minute mark. Uh, we want to make sure that the cornea is fully saturated, and at that time, we'll also check corneal thickness. If it's greater than 400 microns, we'll go ahead and proceed with UV light. If it's less than 400 microns, we'll start administrating the hypotonic riboflavin um, every 10 seconds for two minutes until the cornea swells up to about that 400 or greater micron uh, thickness. At that point, we'll expose the cornea to uh, the UV, um, with the crosshairs focus on the cornea, the patient is just looking up at those UV diodes, and we continue to drop every two minutes for half an hour. Um, after that half hour mark, we go ahead and hit the cornea with ice cold VSS, uh, give it an antibiotic and anti inflammatory, or uh, rather a steroid in this case, and then put a bandaged uh, contact lens on that individual, and they're good to go. So, what are our post-operative expectations? What should we be looking at here? Well, the early post-op should be aimed at, uh, you know, just making sure that the bandage contact lens is still in place and that the underlying uh, epithelial defect is present and that there's no gross complications. So you can see this individual here on the upper right. This is one day post-op cross-linking. I took out the bandage lens and uh, stained him just for the purposes of saying this is about how big the defect is after day one. On day five, that epithelium should be nice and closed. Um, we'll remove our bandage contact lens and at that point we should be nice and healed. A little bit of light SPK is fine. Um, and those individuals uh, will leave the bandage lens out as long as there's no frank epithelial defect. At that point, we'll add preservative-free artificial tears, discontinue our antibiotics and uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, and continue with just our steroid on a taper, typically two to four weeks, depending on who you work with. Um, now, the long-term post-operative care is really aimed at monitoring changes to the baselines and making sure that things are stable, stable uh, and uh, you know, kind of go from there. So let's dive into what we got out of the clinical data um, and review that uh, from the uh, multi-center trial uh, and the trials that we did at our clinic. Um, so. And the U.S. Phase Three clinical trial uh, was started in 2008 with the um, under the uh, medical direction of uh, Dr. Peter Hirsch, um, and we ended up with an FDA approval in uh, 2016. And what we enrolled in this was patients with progressive keratoconus and uh, post-refractive corneal ectasia. The uh, the trial study design uh, was a prospective, randomized, multi-center controlled clinical trial. The treatment group got the uh, the standard corneal collagen cross-linking protocol that we just described, and the control group received uh, riboflavin alone without removal of the epithelium, and uh, you know just stared at the instrument for uh, 30 minutes without uh, any UV irradiation. Um, and what we found, or rather what we were looking at as our primary uh, efficacy, efficacy criteria was a change in uh, KMAX. Um, so our primary endpoint that we were looking to have is a difference of greater than one diopters at the 12 month ma uh, mark, uh, looking at mean K, or excuse me, uh, mean KMAX over the uh, treatment versus the control group. And what we found was at the 12 month mark, uh, the individuals who were treated with corneal collagen cross-linking uh, were uh, 1.6 diopter flatter on their uh, maximum keratometry, and uh, individuals who were the control group who didn't receive uh, corneal collagen cross-linking were steeper by about a diopter uh, at, in their K-max uh, over that one year period of time. So we have a difference between our control and our uh, treated group of uh, 2.6 diopters. Um, now, when we look at this, what we're going to see, this is an example of an individual who's six months post-op corneal collagen cross-linking, and you can see their pre-op uh, uh, topography here, uh, their six months post-op uh, topography here, and if we look at the subtraction map or the difference map, 
you can see that this individual has flattened over the cone, but also steepened uh, in the superior flat region of the cornea. And what we see after corneal collagen cross-linking is this flattening over the cone, steepening over the uh, superior portion of the flat or area of the cornea. So it's kind of a normalization of the cornea or a, a symmetric uh, or a more symmetric uh, move of the cornea after the corneal collagen cross-linking procedure. This is very common to see. Um, now, in the U.S. multi-center, if we look at the timeline of changes of K-Max, what we see is that the baseline here was about a uh, a 60.9 diopter uh, K-Max. At the one-month mark, though, it's about a 62.4, but then it steadily gets less and less until the 12-month uh, mark, where it's about a 59.2. But why does this happen at the one month mark? We see an increase in K-max, right? And then improvements from three months on. So why does that happen? Well, when we look at uh, epithelial thickness maps, and this comes from Lee's work uh, in 2011, or excuse me, 2012, what we've looked at is that uh, keratoconus is associated with a uh, apical thinning of the epithelial layer of the cornea. So what we see is in addition to uh, the thinning overall of the cornea, it also corresponds with the epithelial map that you see on the right there that thins over the thinnest point of the cornea, uh, of the overall cornea. Um, so we see the normal on the left where you have a normal pachymetry thickness and in almost uniform 50 microns of epithelium across the corneal shape, what we also see on these uh, keratoconic epitheliums is that they're thinner over the portion of the cone, and then they thicken around the base of the cone. And you can see this really easily in this severe case over here. You can see that the epithelium has thinned to about uh, 30 microns over the apex of the cornea, and then around the base has uh, increased up to about 53, uh, 53 uh, microns of, uh, of epithelial thickness. Um, so the epithelium really masks the stromal cone. And when we wipe that epithelium away, um, that re-epithelialization comes in as an even sheet, and then that epithelium remodels over time. So that's what's responsible for our initial um, our initial uh, uh, steepening of the cornea. So if we look at the peripheral cornea, you can see the epithelium is nice and thick. When we look at the central cornea over the apex, we can see that that's quite a bit thinner over the apex in comparison. Um, so you can see what we're actually creating there is a, uh, a flatter uh, corneal shape in the yellow with the epithelium on uh, in comparison to the steeper stromal shape underneath the epithelium. So when we wipe that away and it comes back in an even sheet, that epithelium comes back in an even sheet, we have a steeper corneal shape. And as it remodels over time, it tends to create a flatter uh, corneal shape. Uh, the other thing that we end up seeing is that there's an initial decrease of visual acuity at the one month mark, followed by gains at the three month mark. And we can really see that in the studies that were performed at our clinic. Um, but why do we see this? Well, we have an associated corneal haze that's, uh, that's present in these individuals. And again, that's worse at the one month mark and then improves from three months on. But why does that really happen? Well, it's because of corneal apoptosis, the energy created by the uh, uh, the uh, photochemical reaction uh, in the cornea uh, blurs the uh, the keratocytes um, up until about the uh, the 250 micron uh, point into the cornea, and we end up creating this demarcation line in the cornea, so an interface between the cross-linked and non-cross-linked cornea. So you can see that kind of anterior haze there present in both of these corneas. And that's because of the uh, the keratocyte repopulation that happens um, in these corneas at the one month mark. So prior to the one month, um, we've kind of nuked those uh, epi or excuse me those uh, those keratocytes and then they're coming back and we see that sort of haze come in. It's kind of a fine reticular haze. This is not like DLK haze that we would see in individuals after you know, KRK surgeries or other surgeries like that. And this does tend to uh, decrease over time and get to about back to baseline. The other thing that we see is that there's a decrease in uh, corneal thickness at the one to three month mark and improvements from the three month mark forward. 
Um, the other thing that we see is that the endothelial cells are not really affected. There's a minor decrease that we found at the three-month mark. But in general, it comes back to baseline, and there were no signs of persistent uh, uh, edema. Now, the reason that this happens and the reason why we want to thicken our corneas up to the 400 micron uh, mark is that the energy of uh, that 3 milliwatts is attenuated by about a half every, uh, every 100 microns you go into the cornea. So by the time you get 300 microns into the cornea, there's not a level of, uh, of energy that's getting to the, the endothelium uh, that's of any concern that might uh, damage the endothelium. So, you know, after the 300 micron thickness, we're pretty good to go. There's no uh, chance of damaging those cells beyond that area. Now, the other thing that was kind of funny was when we compared the pre-op to 12-month post-op, uh, on patient subjective factors, there was actually a statistically significant improvement in multiple uh, metrics, such as light sensitivity, difficulty driving, reading difficulty, you know, double vision, fluctuation of vision, and glare. So kind of an interesting thing. Now, when we look at the adverse events that happened in the, uh, in the clinical trials here, uh, what we found was that the most common uh, ocular adverse events were related to the epithelial removal and uh, resolved at about the one month mark. So things like, you know, ocular pain, uh, photophobia, blurred vision, punctate keratitis, uh, epithelial defects, all these sorts of things all resolved by basically the one month mark. Now, the one thing that they look at is that transient corneal haze, which we had mentioned previously um, in the uh, in the uh, the trial, this was named opacity, um, which was kind of a poor name uh, for this kind of transient haze that's seen, um, but it does improve over time. Um, now, in the post-market surveillance of the uh, vitro products, um, they've demonstrated safety uh, and performance in line with the FDA approval la uh, the FDA approved labeling. Now, there was one severe adverse event that happened in the uh, the trial. Um, it was a bacterial ulcer that happened in a 19-year-old who was non-compliant with their medication, uh, developed about three days after corneal collagen cross-linking. It was treated with uh, antibiotics, and uh, they also resolved without much of an issue. Um, now, when we look at the clinical summary from all of this, the important thing to recognize is that all metrics generally get worse at the one-month mark and then continue to uh, improve from that uh, one month point on and uh, get back to baseline or in some cases like visual acuity and uh, keratometry uh, metrics, they actually get better than baseline. Um, so recap on the, uh, the corneal collagen cross-linking management, we really want to discuss the expectations with the patient that it is to stop progression of your disease, not to improve vision. Um, and then we want to advise patients on the time course of healing and the improvements that they're going to see. Let them know that the one-month mark is usually going to be the worst, but also the one-month mark is typically uh, when they can go ahead and start wearing their contact lenses again. So who gets con uh, corneal collagen cross-linking? Well, anybody with documented uh, progression. Um, there's been some, um, excuse me, some... Uh, uh, you know, back and forth about do we just do it right away on pediatric patients? When we look at the uh, corneal societies around the world, uh, the consensus is generally if you're under 18, um, there's no point in proving progression for those individuals. Just get them corneal collagen cross-linking because we know that those individuals are uh, at a much, much higher risk of progressing. Uh, progressing. Uh, in the U.S. clinical trials, uh, the labeling says uh, 14 to 65, so if they're younger than that, uh, it's considered off-label. Uh, and the indications are for progressive keratoconus and for uh, post-refractive corneal ectasia. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and jump into a case here of rapid uh, keratoconus progression. Um, so this uh, individual, 16-year-old uh, Caucasian female that comes in to see us, referred by a local optometrist to rule out keratoconus. Uh, medical history was uh, you know, unremarkable. Ocular history, she's been in um, myopia with a system and wearing spectacles. Uh, but she has uh, complaints of worsening vision on the left eye. Her uncorrected visual acuity is actually very, very good. 
her uh, corrected visual acuity is pretty good. And when I manifested her, she was able to get to 20-20 in both eyes with more sill in the left eye, though, uh, that slight anisometropia there in the sill. And, uh, you know, she only corrected to a slow 20-20 minus in that left eye. So we go ahead and get uh, our typical uh, shine plug tomography scans. And what we can see is that on the left eye, she clearly has keratoconus with a 48 diopter, 49 diopter uh, K max, uh, thinner than average cornea at about uh, 470 microns at the thinnest point, anterior elevation of about plus 16, and a posterior elevation of about plus uh, 29. Now, when we look at the right eye, she's also showing early signs of keratoconus on the right eye as well. When we look at the right and the left eye here, we can see on the epi maps and the uh, overall pachymetry maps from the OCT that this individual is clearly thinner than average, and we can see the thinning of the epithelium over the apex of the cone in both eyes. Um, so our diagnosis is clearly keratoconus for this individual. Our plan is to recommend corneal collagen cross-linking on the left eye and then to do the right eye. However, the patients defer, uh, the patient's parents defer treatment until summer vacation is over. So three months later, on her day of the procedure, she comes in. She is complaining that her vision is reduced on the left eye and her uncorrected visual acuity has now gone from 20 uh, 30 to 2100. So we go ahead and get a scan that day, and we can see that this individual has increased dramatically, or rather progressed dramatically, in that very short uh, three month period of time. Um, so what you can see here is that um, you have a uh, the baseline uh, measurement in the center, the uh, measurement uh, uh, at that three month mark. Um, and the progression that's happened in the uh, difference map. So you can see she's progressed 5.3 diopters and actually thinned by 10 microns. So we go ahead and perform our corneal collagen cross-linking. We do our initial therapies, and we're seeing her back at the one-month mark. Uh, the one-month mark, she's complaining that the vision is a little hazy on the left eye. Her visual acuity is reduced by about a line. Her corrective visual acuity with her... Uh, previous glasses was 2060, and I'm able to manifest her down to about 2040, uh, but you can see that dramatic increase in the amount of cylinder that's there. She went from about a two to a min to about a five in the amount of cylinder present. Uh, so when we take a look at the, uh, the values here, um, we go ahead and we get scans. Her right eye has stayed nice and stable. You can see no change there. Her left eye shows just a little bit of, uh, of steepening of that cornea compared to uh, just prior to the uh, corneal collagen cross-linking, which is what we would expect at the one-month mark. Um, what we're going to look at now is kind of the epithelial mapping. So this is kind of an interesting thing to notice. So when we look at the, uh, the pre-op uh, compared to the one-month post-op, uh, what we can see is that the epithelial uh, uh, min max difference uh, has changed from about a uh, 23 micron difference on the uh, the pre-op uh, to about a 15 micron difference uh, on the post-op. And you can see that the epithelium is a little bit thicker um, uh, the post-op uh, compared to the pre-op. So you can see that we have less of that masking effect of the epithelium, which would correspond to this steepening of that cornea at that one month mark. So you can see the area of uh, thickening there in the peripheral cornea on the pre, and that uh, that same area is significantly uh, thinner uh, on the uh, the post. Um, so when we take a look at the, uh, the OCT, we can also see that clear demarcation line present at about the 250 micron depth. So you can see that little bit of haze in the cornea uh, when we compare our pre-op to our one-month post-op. Uh, the other thing that we can look at is shine flung depth cytometry, and we can compare our pre, uh, which is on the left, to our one-month post on the right. And what you want to look at here is the anterior and central uh, uh, measurements here, uh, basically higher numbers indicate more uh, opacity present or more haze in the cornea. Um, and you can see that being demonstrated here uh, pre to uh, one month post-op. 
And when we look at this in another form, we can go ahead and see all the scans of the cornea. And these are the areas of metrics that I want you to look at. And what you can see is that when I change this to the post-op, here you can see how everything got a little bit more frosty and a little bit uh, a little bit uh, more opaque. Um, so what was our plan on this individual? Where our plan is to go ahead and follow up uh, at our uh, in two months to see her for a three month post op visit on her left eye. Um, we're also going to do corneal collagen cross link in our next available uh, procedure day. And then afterwards, we're going to go ahead and refer her for contact lenses. Well, she's lost to follow up until two years later when she comes in. She's now an 18 year old female who, uh, you know, is experiencing a uh, not quite a loss of vision, but says that her vision is different in her right eye and that she's leaving soon to go to college. Um, so what we can look at here is that um, her uh, her visual acuity um, has uh, stayed about the same in the right eye. She still corrects to about 2020. Her left eye, her uh, manifest has changed dramatically, and she's now correcting down to about 2020. Uh, you can see her sill has reduced quite a bit, uh, though her uh, her myopia, or excuse me, her uh, spherical value is also uh, become a little bit more myopic as well. So when we take a look at what's happened here over that period of time, uh, on those maps, you can see that on her right eye, um, she has uh, she has progressed. On her left eye, she's actually regressed. So if we take a look at her uh, post-op, uh, or rather her pre-op uh, left eye, and compare that to the uh, to the two-year post-op. Uh, we can see that we're getting about two and a half diopters of flattening over that period of time. Whereas on her right eye, if we take a look at her baseline scan compared to her scan two years later, she's progressed about two diopters on that eye. Uh, now, the one thing that I want to go ahead and point out when we're looking at the haze on the left eye, when we look at the uh, one month post op, which is down on the bottom here, Compared to the two years post-op, you can see that that cornea is much clearer. That demarcation line is almost completely disappeared. And we can see that that haze is reduced and gone back to about baseline. And we look at our shine flag densitometry. This is the one month post-op. And when we look at those metrics again, you can see how that cornea clears up over that one month, or excuse me, over that two year period of time. Um, so what are, what are we going to do here? Well, this individual clearly has uh, progressed on the right eye. It is stable with some normalization on the left eye. Um, our plan is to perform corneal collagen cross-linking on the right eye as soon as possible and then refer for, uh, or excuse me, then uh, go ahead and fit uh, contact lenses for the individual after that. But the patient's uh, parents again defer corneal collagen cross-linking until after vacation. We performed the corneal collagen cross-linking three, month three months later, uh, but then the patient was lost to follow up after the one, one or excuse me, after the one week post-op visit. So kind of unfortunate there. Um, but there are lessons to be learned here, which is that rapid progression can occur at any time, and it's important to monitor closely uh, in high-risk patients. And then our second is to, uh, you know, uh, note that corneal collagen cross-linking can flatten the corneal curvature. And though that's not the purpose of the treatment, it can be beneficial, uh, such as we saw with the uh, changes uh, in the refractive values and the ability to uh, better correct her in her spectacles. Um, the next one is to go ahead and talk a little bit about contact lenses for keratoconus. Uh, there are a variety of modalities that will work. Obviously, this is like a Lens Education Society uh, lecture, so we're going to talk a little bit about scleral lenses um, and the importance that they have here. Um, this individual has severe keratoconus, and you can see um, that they have quite a bit of uh, higher order aberrations that are present uh, without the lens. But with the lens on, you can see that that uh, curvature normalizes, the higher order aberrations decrease. And when we look at the overall uh, higher order aberrations of the eye, they decrease dramatically. And you can see that the simulated vision is significantly better with the contact lens uh, than without the contact lens. So we're not telling anybody anything they don't know clearly, uh, especially contact lenses are indicated in these individuals to improve their uh, their visual acuities. 
Um, but the one thing to note is that progression can be masked by a contact lens. So this 23-year-old male comes in, he's status post-corneal collagen cross-linking in both eyes, uh, almost six years prior to this visit. Um, he's been wearing scleral lenses successfully for a visual acuity on the right eye of 2020 and the left eye being 2025. His vision has been stable uh, over the last several visits. Uh, in the contact lenses. However, when we do his maps, we do a comparison map with contact lenses on, uh, we can see that on the right eye, he stayed nice and stable, but on the left eye, he's actually progressed almost two diopters. Um, so you can see that here, progressing about two diopters on that left eye. So you can see that his vision was not affected by that progression of the cornea. Um, so the lessons here are that the contact lenses can actually mask progression. So you, it's of utmost importance that on these follow-ups, when you're seeing these individuals back, you need to take the lens off, evaluate topography, ensure that uh, you know everything looks nice and stable. And the second lesson here is that though it's rare, progression can still happen after corneal collagen cross-linking. So it's important to monitor patients often and appropriately uh, based on their risks, the risk factors. Um, the last thing that I want to mention here tonight is that uh, corneal collagen cross-linking and scleral lenses can have an impact on the uh, amount of corneal transplants being performed on individuals. Uh, so if we look at the iBank data, now I like to use the 2016 iBank data. It's not much different from uh, 2016 all the way up to the uh, 2018 report. But the reason that I use this data is because it's the last data where they uh, differentiate keratoconus. Uh, from, uh, you know, other ectatic diseases. Uh, it's not lumped together as corneal ectasia or corneal ectatic disease in the, uh, the classification. Uh, but what you can see is that um, overall, uh, keratoconus is the number one indication for penetrating keratoplasty and uh, deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty. Um, what you can see, though, is also that the second most common indication for penetrating keratoplasty is repeat corneal transplant. So this is kind of interesting data. Now, what you also see is that the red line is a uh, endothelial keratop keratoplasty, and the blue line is a penetrating keratoplasty. Um, I know that this is a talk on uh, uh, keratoconus, um, but the important thing to notice here is that endothelial keratoplasties, as those have increased, um, you know, uh, penetrating keratoplasties have gone down in the amount of utilization overall. Um, but if we look at those baselines of uh, penetrating keratoplasty, those baselines of penetrating keratoplasty may be being affected by uh, corneal collagen cross-linking and uh, scleral lenses. So when we look at corneal collagen cross-linking and its impact on penetrating keratoplasty utilization, if we look at this study out of the Netherlands, what they found is that when they compared uh, the uh, pre-corneal collagen cross-linking numbers of uh, penetrating keratoplasties um, from uh, 2005 to 2007 and compared that to a same time frame uh, from 2012 to 2014, uh, after the uh, initiation of uh, corneal collagen cross-linking, what they found was 25% fewer corneal transplants were performed uh, in that period of time. So what they're saying is that there is a direct impact of corneal collagen cross-linking uh, on the uh, utilization of uh, penetrating keratoplasties, so they're seeing a reduction uh, in penetrating keratoplasties performed. Um, now, scleral lenses have also had an impact on penetrating keratoplasty. So if you look at uh, this study that came at, comes out of uh, uh, Antwerp, um, what uh, uh, Dr. Coffin had done was uh, fitted uh, scleral lenses for individuals who would have otherwise undergone corneal transplantation. And what they found was that 40 of the 51 eyes were successfully fit uh, with a scleral lens and thus avoided the need for penetrating keratoplasty. So that's also reducing the amount of penetrating keratoplasties that are done in the uh, uh, on individuals with keratoconus. So in uh, summary, 
Corneal College and Crosslinking is now the new standard of care. And, uh, you know, modern management of keratoconus should be to diagnose it as early as possible, stop progression with corneal collagen crosslinking, rehabilitate vision by both uh, exposed to contact lens methods or surgical interventions, and to monitor those individuals often so that we can make sure that there are no changes happening. And, you know, keep our modern forms of uh, corneal transplantation there as a last resort. Uh, now, what does the future of corneal collagen cross-linking hold? Well, there are various, uh, you know, various explorations of, uh, you know, delivering this uh, treatment being explored, uh, various different ways of delivering riboflavin, whether that's transepithelial or iontophoresis. Um, transepithelial has been uh, actually explored by a vitros, a U.S.-based uh, trial. Uh, UV delivery has also been uh, looked at. So there are accelerated and pulsed light uh, forms, uh, as well as topography-guided uh, light forms, and all of those are being studied by Avidro in the U.S. and outside of the U.S., as well as uh, oxygen supplementation to make that uh, oxygen-limited reaction uh, more robust. And that, again, was done in the United States in Avidro's Epion trial, uh, which we'll see results on later. Um, so with that, we'll go ahead and uh, wrap this puppy up and answer any questions that we have. Thank you, John, so much. That was uh, very, very informative, as always. Uh, we do have a few questions here. Before we get to these questions, uh, a copy of this webinar will be available uh, on the Sclera Lens Society YouTube page, as well as the Sclera Lens Society website within the next few days. So uh, if you do want to watch it again, I know there's a ton of information to digest there. Uh, please keep an eye on those two outlets uh, for a copy of the presentation. Uh, this also, because it was uh, a sponsored lecture on an unrestricted educational grant by the great folks at Avidro. This is not one that will be offered for COPE credit. Uh, it was just an informative lecture uh, that we presented uh, on behalf of the Sclera Lens Education Society. So a couple of quick questions here. Um, the first one, is there a minimum pre-op uh, corneal thickness that you look for uh, before doing cross-linking? So, um when you look at uh, you know pre-op corneal thicknesses, um, those can be somewhat deceiving um, because when we remove the epithelium, let's say an individual had a uniform 50 microns, when we remove the epithelium, if they're 400 microns thick, if we remove that epithelium, they now drop to 350 microns, right? Then you know during the uh, the procedure we can swell the cornea and we can swell that cornea pretty significantly in some cases up to 100 even 150 microns of swelling to that cornea. So that uh, you know 350 microns of thickness now can become 450 microns or even 500 microns of thickness before we hit it with a light. So you know typically the surgeons are going to have uh, or uh, yeah the surgeons are going to have a pretty good idea as to whether or not an individual will uh, will thicken enough to do uh, corneal collagen cross-linking for them. So generally, I say, you know, unless they're, you know, sub, uh, you know, 300 microns of thickness, I send them to the, uh, to the surgeon for, um, you know, for evaluation either way uh, to see, you know, do they think that they could thicken this enough or swell the cornea enough during the procedure to be able to make it safe so that we don't fry the endothelium. So I would say, you know, uh, minimum, probably sub 300, uh, you know, likely not a candidate, but I would still send that to be evaluated by the, uh, the surgeon to see if they think that, you know, they might get some luck on that and uh, swell them up to an area that they could safely perform the procedure. Next question, uh, have you, uh, do you guys clinically, or is there any data out there that would support using intacts in combination with cross-linking? So we actually just published a study on that, uh, looking at uh, sequential versus uh, um, uh, simultaneous uh, intacts implantation uh, with um, corneal collagen cross-linking. Uh, and what we found was that there really wasn't much of a difference between the, uh, you know, sequential versus, um, 
uh, versus simultaneous use of it, what we did find was that there was an increase in uh, in uh, 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 curvature change. Um, you know, intacts can induce, uh, and you, you'll have to look at this paper to get the exact numbers, but we were able to make uh, maximum keratometry changes of up to nine diopters on those individuals and, uh, you know, increase, uh, you know, lines of uh, visual acuity by, uh, you know, one to two lines. Um, so when we look at them kind of in combination, uh, the two of those can be beneficial because you can look at corneal collagen cross-linking as being the method to stabilize the cornea, uh, whereas Intex would be used uh, to improve curvature and improve uh, visual acuity. Now, with Intex, um, and by vi visual acuity, I'm talking about uh, spectacle visual acuity or um, uh, uh, uncorrected visual acuity. Generally, when you're using contact lenses, you know, you're going to mask the cornea anyway, so, you know, you're not really going to see much of a change with that, but you can make these individuals, you know, more balanced in their refractions, um, other things like that to be able to make them a little bit more punctual when they're not wearing especially contact lenses. Uh, what is your favorite tool for monitoring progression, or is it just a combination of topography, K-value, spectrometry, et cetera? So, so yeah, so, so I will tell you right now, um, uh, I, I've been extraordinarily fortunate to work in the clinic that I do, uh, and we have access to just about every toy that's out there. Um, you know, uh, everything from, you know, multiple tomography devices, multiple placido ring devices, multiple aberrometers, just about everything out there. Um, but I will tell you that the most valuable devices that are out there for primary care guys are, uh, you know, uh, combined devices that will allow you to get, you know, a placido, a shine plug, uh, you know, a uh, aperometry all in one device. Um, you know, also having the Pentacam, basically anything that you have that has the technology to monitor those uh, metrics, that's the most important thing. Um, if you don't have the technology to monitor those metrics, uh, you, you really need to incorporate that. So the, the real big point here uh, with this lecture and being combined with the uh, Scleral Lens Education Society is, you know, you need to have the understanding of the disease and how to manage it, how to monitor it, and all those sorts of things. Uh, and if you don't have the, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the ability to do that and you're fitting contact lenses on these individuals, you know, you, you really need to start looking at the disease rather than just saying, oh, I'm fitting a contact lens for these individuals. Um, but yeah, as far as, you know, instruments are really uh, concerned, um, you know, anything that's going to get you, you know, values of, uh, you know, keratometric values, looks at the front and the back surface of the cornea, thicknesses, and aperometry. I love all of that. And we're currently looking at, you know, various different low-cost tools uh, to kind of do this uh, and some suggestions of, you know, metrics that may suggest that an individual has keratoconus and should go through a workup for that. Um, so stay tuned. <laughs> And then finally, the last question talks about how obviously the goal is to halt progression of keratoconus. And the question is, is why does it need to be repeated? I guess uh, if you could just touch on is there certain things you'll, certain individuals who are more likely to progress after cross linking based on age or uh, keratoconus type or topography or any of those things that you would watch closer? Got it, got it. So, so age has been a risk factor in this. You know, pediatric individuals. Um, you know, clearly if you're treating them at 13, you want to make sure that, you know, because obviously if they have keratoconus that's visible at age 13, they have a very aggressive form of the disease. Um, if they go through cross-linking and, uh, you know, progress a couple, you know, years down the line, then we repeat the uh, corneal collagen cross-linking. Um, those individuals, um, that progress after corneal collagen cross-linking are, are very rare. Um, that, that is by far not the norm. Uh, you can look at corneal collagen cross-linking as being over 90% effective at stopping the disease, and that's extremely important um, 
uh, to these uh, to these factors. Um, but when you do see an individual who uh, who does progress, uh, you can safely retreat them with corneal collagen cross-linking to uh, mitigate that effect. Um, now, as far as risk factors are concerned, you know, age would be one. Um, you know, uncontrolled atopic disease, other things like that uh, would be another. Pregnancy would be another that I've seen. Uh, but, you know, there's so few of these cases that the literature uh, is not good at, you know, saying who progresses, who, you know, afterwards. Um, and it is a very, very rare occurrence. I, I can, I cannot stress that enough. But it does happen, so it is important to monitor these individuals even after they've had this. Just like if you had an individual who underwent a MIGS procedure to lower their IOP, you'd continue to continue to monitor their glaucoma to make sure that you know changes aren't happening or loss of uh, you know structure or function isn't happening. It's the same thing here with these individuals who have undergone corneal collagen cross-linking. You want to make sure that you're monitoring to make sure that the you know the structure of the corneal shape is not changing or the thickness, um, and also the function, the visual acuity is not decreasing either. Um, so so yeah, very important to monitor those individuals. Well, John, thank you so much. This was an absolutely information-packed lecture, as, as always, from you. So we uh, appreciate you. We appreciate the people at Avidro for sponsoring tonight.